Well, good morning, New Day. Today, I'd like to begin with a quote. Maybe you've heard it before, maybe you haven't, but here it is. Sin will take you farther than you ever expected to go. It will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay, and it will cost you more than you ever expected to pay. Now, whether you attend here in Enfield, in Agawam, or online, church, would you say this with me? Let's say it out loud together. Sin will take you farther than you ever expected to go. It will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. And it will cost you more than you ever expected to pay. Church, this is the great truth found in the passage that we're studying today. For those who are new right now as a church, we're studying through the gospel of Matthew. And right now we find ourselves in a mini-series within Matthew's gospel that we're calling the story of the cross. And today we come to the part of the story where Judas Iscariot one of the 12 betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and comes to regret it greatly. And this is why I've entitled my sermon this week, which comes from Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 to 10, The Betrayer's Regret. He comes to regret his betrayal because he found out firsthand That sin will take you farther than you ever expected to go. It will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. And it will cost you more than you ever expected to pay. All right, let's get into the story. We're going to see four simple things in our text today. Number one, the betrayer's crime. Number two, the betrayer's conscience. Number three, the betrayer's compensation. And number four, the betrayer's contribution. We're going to take these one at a time, beginning with the betrayer's crime. And we're going to read about Judas's crime in verses one to two. But before we get to that, let me kind of back up and give you some much needed context on Judas. When Jesus invited Judas to follow him, Judas said yes, but not for the reason you might think. You say, oh, he decided to follow Jesus because he just loved God and wanted to use his life to be a light for the lost. Nope, that's not the biblical record at all. Judas wanted to follow Jesus because he assumed that it would equal a very large payday for him where he would become one of Jesus's right hand men. And Jesus, of course, was God's promised Messiah, the king who would rule uh, over the world forever. And Judas said, man, if I'm one of his right-hand men, that's going to equal a big payout for me. But here's the deal. As we begin the third year of Jesus's ministry, Judas had not yet received the payout that he was hoping for. So you know what he began doing? He began stealing. As John records in his gospel, in chapter 12, verse 8, having charge of the money bag, he, Judas, used to help himself to what was put into it. So not getting what he joined Jesus for, he began to get the reason he had joined Jesus for by stealing from the common purse that the 12 disciples and Jesus shared. Well, one day... Again, towards the beginning of Jesus' third and final year of ministry, Judas thought he saw a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Jesus had performed an unbelievable miracle, feeding a crowd that in men alone numbered 5,000, never mind the women and children. And after performing this great miracle of feeding that huge crowd with just two fish and five loaves, the crowd intended to take Jesus and Make him by force their king. And Judas thought, finally, my payday's coming. 
But Jesus said, let's get in a boat and row over to Capernaum. And with every row of the oar, Judas felt his dream of becoming rich slipping away. Over the next year, when Judas was expecting that he'd be moving closer towards the time when Jesus would become king and the time when he would become rich, uh, throughout that year, when Judas thought that was going to happen, instead, here's what happened. Jesus began to talk more and more and more about his suffering that would take place at the hands of the religious leaders of Israel. And Jesus began to talk more and more and more about his death that would take place at the hands of the Romans. This is not what Judas wanted. This is not what he expected. And then came the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back. Jesus, about a week before his crucifixion, rides into Jerusalem and the people give Jesus the red carpet treatment. They lay down their cloaks and palm branches on the road and they hail Jesus as the promised Messiah who would descend from the royal line of David and who would rule as king forever. And again, Judas thought, all right, it didn't happen back when Jesus fed the huge crowd. Jesus wouldn't accept becoming king then, but surely he will accept becoming king now. Now is the moment where Jesus is going to defeat his enemies, subjugate the evil Romans, and establish his kingdom. And then he will bestow upon me and the other disciples here who have followed him so closely these last few years, glory and riches. However, they no sooner arrived in Jerusalem than Jesus began to teach them. This is Matthew chapter 24 and 25. They no sooner arrived in Jerusalem than Jesus began to teach them that his kingdom was a future kingdom that wouldn't materialize until the end of the age. And then Jesus began reiterating what he had been telling them repeatedly throughout that year. Guys, the Passover is coming and the son of man will be delivered to be crucified. So Judas thought he's going to become king and Jesus says, no, I'm going to die. And friends, this is the point at which Judas said, I'm done. I'm done with Jesus. I'm out. No more for me. I've already wasted three years of my life. I'm not wasting any more. So He came up with a plan on how he could profit from Jesus, which had been his plan from day one. According to Luke 22, it was common knowledge that the Sanhedrin was looking for a way by which they might put Jesus to death. And Judas decided he would capitalize on the opportunity before him. So we read in Matthew 26, verses 15 to 16, that Judas went to the chief priests and he said, What will you give me if I deliver Jesus over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, Judas sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. Now, friends, I want us to get a feel for how much money, in today's terms, 30 pieces of silver was back then. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I read this, my question in my mind is always, was this a lot of money back then? Was this a small amount of money uh, that was like an insult? Was this a huge amount of money that was like, woohoo? Or was this like somewhere in between? So let me do my best to try to help you understand how much this was in today's terms. Each silver coin that he was given was worth four days' wages. So he was given a sum that equaled 120 days wages, or more simply put, four months wages. Now, if we were to convert that into uh, today's equivalent, we would have to first understand the median household income in our area, which is roughly 85,000 a year. So that comes out to roughly $7,000 a month. So $7,000 a month times four He was paid, in today's equivalency, some $28,000. So in today's terms, Judas betrayed Jesus for the cost of a new Honda Accord. It wasn't the payout that he was hoping for. 
But as they say, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. Meaning it's better to get something than nothing. And he had to be compensated for the last three years or so that he had wasted his life. So he took the money and he looked for an opportunity to betray Jesus because that's what he got paid to do. And he had to betray Jesus specifically away from the crowds because, again, the people had held that Jesus at that point was their promised Messiah. So Judas's job was to betray Jesus away from the crowds. And friends, that's why Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was outside of Jerusalem. It was up a, a hill called the Mount of Olives. And it was in a secluded garden that Jesus and his disciples had permission to meet in uh, anytime they wanted. After Jesus was arrested, he spent the entire evening... Enduring an illegal trial at the high priest's house. And by morning, the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of Israel, as it were, concluded that Jesus was guilty of the sin of blasphemy and they sentenced Jesus to death. But having determined that Jesus needed to die, they now had to brainstorm together how exactly their plans were going to be fulfilled because... The Romans who occupied Israel during this time had revoked the Sanhedrin's right to exercise capital punishment. So Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter 27 verse 1, when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. In other words, when morning came, they left Caiaphas's house and they convened in the temple in what would have been the hall of hewn stone, which was the section of the temple where court was held. But instead of holding court, since they had already done that at Caiaphas's, Caiaphas's house illegally throughout the night, they instead discussed how they might put Jesus to death. And friends, they quickly realized that the only way they were going to put Jesus to death was to get the Romans involved, which is why they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the Roman governor. Now, friends, understand, Pilate normally lived in Caesarea Maritima, which was the capital of Judea for the Romans. But for the annual feast of Passover, he would travel to Jerusalem, which was the capital of Judea, for the Jews. And he, of course, was not there to worship or to participate in any of the religious ceremonies. No, he was there to keep the Jewish people in check. You see, when they would meet, they'd get all pumped up and have all kinds of religious fervor. And that represented a threat to Rome, who again occupied Israel at that time. So Pilate was there as hundreds of thousands of Jews uh, would have made Jerusalem swell in population and he was there to make sure things didn't get out of control. And the Sanhedrin knew that this Pilate, the Roman governor who was in town to keep the Jews in check, he knew that this Pilate was their only hope of putting Jesus to death because unlike them, Pilate, the Roman governor, had the authority to exercise capital punishment. So, the Sanhedrin escorted Jesus from the temple to Herod's palace, which is where Pilate stayed during the feast, with the goal of getting Pilate to confirm what they had already decided, which was Jesus was worthy of death. So friends, I know that was a really long point, but all that to say, so we see the betrayer's crime Judas's crime was that he sold out Jesus to the Jewish authorities for an amount that in today's terms would be $28,000. Now, the question begs, was Judas happy? He had successfully worked his plan. He got the desire of his heart. He received uh, the payout that he was hoping for. And the question begs, was he happy? And this brings us really nicely from the betrayer's crime to the second thing we see in our text, which is the betrayer's conscience. 
the betrayer's conscience. Judas's sin, which resulted in the payout that he had been waiting so long for, far from filling him with joy, instead filled him with guilt. As Matthew tells us, then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Now, friends, at first glance, it appears here that Judas is repenting of his sin. But we know for a number of reasons that this was not the case. The main reason we know is because Jesus makes clear that Judas was going to spend eternity in hell. So we know from Jesus himself that this was not genuine repentance. So now the question begs, well then, what was it? And friends, as we study this, what we learn is that Judas was not looking for forgiveness No, Judas was looking for relief from his guilty conscience that tormented him for the sin that he had committed. You see, the Bible says that God's law is written upon our hearts. So when we sin, uh, the Holy Spirit's job is to convict our hearts of the wrong that we have done, that it might turn us to repentance, which leads to salvation. But Judas, unfortunately, wasn't looking for forgiveness of sins. He was just looking for relief from his guilt-ridden conscience that wouldn't stop telling him over and over and over, you have sinned. We know he wasn't looking for forgiveness for had he been looking for forgiveness, he might have turned to Jesus. But no, instead, he goes to the Sanhedrin. And he doesn't ask for forgiveness. When he goes to the Sanhedrin, he takes the 30 uh, pieces of silver that he had been given and he returns it. So here's Judas's guilt overwhelming him. So he turns to the Sanhedrin for help. But did they help him? Of course not. Cold-hearted men that they were, they said to him, you've betrayed innocent blood? (laughs) Well, what's that to us? See to that yourself. In other words, Judas, that's your problem. Judas got angry at this. He got angry for two reasons. One, he was not able to relieve the guilt that tormented his conscience. And he got angry because here were the religious leaders of Israel, maybe the ones that could point him in the right direction and help him out with his problem. And they were absolutely worthless as spiritual leaders. So we see the betrayer's conscience that it was guilty riddled with guilt. All right, now that you've seen the betrayer's conscience, let's now note together the third thing we see in our text, and we'll call this the betrayer's compensation. Here's what Judas was hoping for. Judas was hoping for a payout that would allow him to start over in life. Again, he felt that he had wasted the last three years of his life. And it seems that Judas's plan was to take the 30 pieces of silver and use it to buy himself a piece of land and maybe start living on that land, working that land, and just starting a new life. We know this because in Acts chapter 1, verse 18, we, we learn that Judas was trying to use that money that he had received from the Sanhedrin to purchase some land, what the Bible calls the potter's field, which means it may have had the clay uh, that potters used, or it could have meant that... Uh, There was no more clay on the land, and so he got a great deal for it. But either way, Judas' plan was to buy that land and start a new life. That's what he was hoping for. But is that what he got? No. Judas returned the money that he had received. So the compensation of the 30 pieces of silver that would help him start a new life, that is now gone. He's returned that to the Sanhedrin in the temple. So friends, if his compensation wasn't money, then the question begs, what was it? And friends, sadly, the answer is death. Matthew tells us that not being able to relieve his guilty conscience by returning the money, he departed from the temple and he went 
and hanged himself. And friends, did you know that he hung himself on the very piece of land that he had intended to start his new life on? He just knew from his guilt-ridden conscience, I'll never be able to enjoy it. And so he decided to kill himself on it. Judas, not being able to relieve his guilt on his own, which he had tried to do at the temple, and not being uh, willing to relieve his guilt God's way, which is through genuine repentance, he decided that he would try and silence his conscience another way, by taking, it, by taking his own life. Which, friends, understand was an absolute fool's errand. Because apart from Christ... Killing yourself, it doesn't relieve your guilt, it fixes it permanently. And it intensifies it beyond comprehension. We know this because Jesus repeatedly throughout his ministry spoke of hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping symbolizes regret. Gnashing of teeth symbolizes torment. So taking your own life, That doesn't relieve your guilt. That doesn't turn off your guilty conscience. That doesn't fix anything except to fix your guilt and your guilty conscience permanently for all eternity. The reality is that Judas right now is in a place the Bible calls Hades, which is the place that the unrighteous go to when they die so they can await the final judgment, which God's word calls the great white throne judgment. And right now, this very second, in Hades, Judas is just as much tormented in his conscience as he was before he took his own life, except now it's probably to an even greater degree. So again, what was Judas's true compensation? It wasn't a fat payout. It was death. As James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes in his epistle... Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth what church brings forth? Death. And that's what happened with Judas. His sin brought forth death. This was his compensation. So it wasn't happiness like he thought. It was death, both physical and spiritual. So that, friends, is the betrayer's compensation. And now that we've seen that, let's note the fourth and final thing we see in our text, and we'll call this the betrayer's contribution. You know, the reality is every single one of us makes a contribution through our life to this world. For some people, it's a great contribution. For other people, it's a minor contribution. But every single one of us makes some kind of contribution or legacy uh, to this world through our lives. Well, in our last few verses, we're going to consider what Judas's contribution was to this world. And as it turns out, his contribution was fulfilling the words of the prophets That foretold that God's messenger, Messiah, would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver in the New Testament. The same way that God's prophet, Zechariah, had been betrayed for 30 pieces of silver in the Old Testament. And that's what we see in verses 6 through 10. Here's how it happened. After Judas hurled his 30 coins throughout the temple... The chief priests picked him up and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it's blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them, meaning the 30 silver coins, the potter's field, meaning the land that Judas had planned to buy. And since Judas had hung himself there, they decided that it would be appropriate to use it as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day because it was bought with blood money. And now Matthew, reflecting on all of this, says in verse 9, Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. 
Now, the wording here is a little bit confusing, but that's why you've got me spending 20 hours a week preparing sermons like this for you. So let me explain it to you. It's actually pretty simple, but it took me quite a while to get to the bottom of it. Here's the deal. In Zechariah chapter 11, God sends his prophet Zechariah to shepherd his people Israel and to rescue them in the same way that a shepherd rescues his sheep from harm. But the people of Israel rejected Zechariah, the one that God had sent, and they pay 30 pieces of silver to get rid of him. And because this was an insult, the 30 pieces of silver are hurled defiantly into the temple. And here's how this was a foreshadow in Matthew's mind of what happened to Jesus. Just as God had sent his prophet Zechariah to his people, so God had sent his prophet Jesus to his people. Just as Zechariah was to shepherd the people, protecting them from harm, so Jesus was to come and shepherd the people Israel and protect them from spiritual harm. But just as the people of Israel rejected Zechariah's ministry, so it was that they rejected Jesus' ministry as well. Just as Israel of old paid 30 pieces of silver to get rid of Zechariah, so present-day Israel, through their leaders, paid 30 pieces of silver to get rid of Jesus. And just as the 30 silver coins in Zechariah's case were contemptuously thrown into the temple, so were the 30 silver coins in Judas's case, in Jesus's case. So Matthew here references the scroll of Jeremiah, which would have included many different prophets' writings, including the prophet Zechariah, and says that what happened to Jesus in Zechariah's time, it was ultimately fulfilled in what had just happened to Jesus now. So we see that Judas's contribution to the world was to be the one who fulfilled Zechariah's prophecy, which was contained in the scroll of Jeremiah. So church, that is the story of Judas Iscariot and how he betrayed Jesus and how he came to regret it greatly. And now that I've told you the story, now that we've studied the text, we turn our attention to asking ourselves what God would have us take away from it. And church, it's very, very, very straightforward. God wants us to know that sin will take you farther than you ever expected to go. It will keep you longer than you ever intended to pay, and it will cost you more than you ever expected to pay. Church, Agawam, Enfield, Church Online, would you say it with me one more time out loud? Sin will take you farther than you ever expected to go. It will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. And it will cost you more than you ever expected to pay. This is the takeaway. This is the great truth that we find in the text that we've studied today. And friends, we need to remember this truth lest the betrayer's regret becomes our own. Judas' story reminds us of sin's deceptive nature. It always, 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 hear me church, over promises and under delivers. And God saw to it that this text was preserved for you and for me because he wants to spare us from personally experiencing this reality of having sin promise the world and then completely under deliver. I don't know why, but this just keeps coming in my spirit, so I'm going to mention it. Um, I, I was doing some, uh, some research, some study. I was listening to a podcast, and it just mentioned how every year in the United States, there's over 80,000 people who die uh, from an opioid-related death. You think anyone takes opioids going, oh, I can't wait to die. No, they go, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to get high. It's going to be great. This is fantastic. Can't wait to party and have a good time. That's what sin promises. What does it deliver? It delivers 
death. And to some degree, this is true of all sin. Sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death, both physical and spiritual, both physical and eternal. Now, we are all in one of three positions in relation to sin. Position one, we're being tempted by it. Position two, we're indulging it, but without any immediate consequence. Or number three, we have indulged it and it has wreaked havoc in our lives. All of us right now are in one of three positions regarding sin. And I want to talk briefly about the appropriate response for each of those three positions. So friends, position number one, you're being tempted by sin. If that's where you're at, then the appropriate response is to resist that sin. The appropriate response is to call out to God, praying, God, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And you can find motivation for resisting from the sermon that we've studied today. You remind yourself, it's not going to be worth it. It's going to take me farther than I wanted to go. It's going to keep me longer than I wanted to stay. And it's going to cost me way more than I ever expected to pay. And so if you're being tempted, the appropriate response is to resist. Secondly, if you're in that second position where you're indulging sin, but it has not resulted in immediate negative consequence. So right now you're like, hey, I'm just sort of enjoying my sin. Really ain't nothing bad happening, nothing too bad anyway. And I'm just kind of enjoying it. And I guess it'll just sort of go on like this forever. If that's where you're at, the appropriate response is to remember that you cannot get away with something God has said you can't get away with. And when it comes to sin, God has promised you will not get away with it. Not not in this life and definitely not in the life to come. You say, Mike, where does it say that in the Bible? Friends, take a look with me at Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 through 8. God says this. Well, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. This is God's warning to us. You better cut that out. It's going to catch up with you. And you're not going to be happy with the results. I know sin promises the world, but sin always over promises and under delivers. It's going to take you further than you wanted to go. It's going to keep you longer than you expected to stay. And it's going to cost more than you were ever willing to pay. Friends, can I remind you that you can eat a salami sandwich one day and you might not yet have that heart attack, but you keep that up for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. What happens? Catches up with you. Heart attack comes. Well, friends, when it comes to sin, spiritual heart attack, it's coming. A man will reap what he sows. Finally, if you're in that third position I talked about, where you've indulged in sin with great consequence, possibly with overwhelming consequences, if that's you, you came to church on a great day. Because God wants you to know that there is forgiveness Relief from guilt, peace, healing, and hope for your future through faith in Christ. Maybe the consequences of your sin and the persistent nagging of guilt has made you be tempted to go the way of Judas. And if that's you, I want to remind you, as we learned from Judas's example Killing yourself does not relieve your guilt. It fixes it permanently and it intensifies it exponentially, which is why Jesus always refers to hell as being a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, regret and unending torment. The truth is there's only one way to find relief from guilt and forgiveness of sins and peace in your heart and hope for your future. And friends, that's through faith in Christ. A lot of people say, I I don't like that answer. 
Sorry. It's the only way to find forgiveness of sin, peace in your heart, and hope for your future. Friends, in this mini-series, we're studying the story of the cross. It's a story that tells us that Jesus died on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our guilt, so that we could have a remedy for the shame and guilt and consequences that sin always brings. Jesus today is offering to help us begin rebuilding our lives if we've messed them up. And he has provided the people that comprise his church to help you every single step of the way. So if you need to, I want to encourage you today to call out to Jesus instead of remaining in your sin. Why? Because one last time, sin will take you farther than you expected to go. It will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. And it will cost you more than you ever expected to pay. Let's pray. Wherever you're participating today, whether that be Enfield, Agawam, or online, would you join me in praying to God? Don't pray out loud. It's a sacred moment just between you and God. And maybe you'd say something like this to God in your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the warning that I've received through the passage that we've studied today. And I pray for your help to heed it and not ignore it. Today, I choose to repent of my sin. And God, it's it's a statement of faith. God, I repent. That is my, my statement of faith. I'm believing for your help to do this very thing. God, today, I repent of my sin, knowing that it hurts me, hurts others, and much more importantly, offends you. I know that my sin's deserving of punishment, but I thank you today that Jesus endured my punishment on the cross. And I thank you that because of him, I can find forgiveness of sins. Because he was willing to be betrayed by 30 pieces of silver, I can be forgiven. I can find relief from guilt, peace in my heart, and hope for my future. So, Father, today I put all my hope and trust and faith in him to make me right with you and to help me now navigate this life saying yes to you and no to sin. Because, God, now I know it'll take me further than I wanted to go. It'll keep me longer than I wanted to stay. And it'll cost me more than I was ever willing to pay. So, Father, I pray for your help. And I ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for experiencing this message with us. Do you want more New Day Church in your life? Well, please like and subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Want to take a next step in your faith? Our Church Center app is the best place to get more connected. So just download the free app on your app store today and be sure to choose New Day Church in Enfield, Connecticut. We are able to offer this sermon and all others like it only because of your faithful financial support. Thank you to all of you who so faithfully give each week. If you feel led to support our ministry financially, just go to our website at newdaychurch.cc forward slash give. Thank you in advance. May God richly bless you and we hope to see you again real soon.